Welcome. I'm Jasiri Jenkins Glenn. I'm Lynn Dunton. And you are tuned in to Santa Cruz Currents. Keeping you current in all things Santa Cruz. We have a great show in store for you today. And now for the news. Dentist, completing its 23rd year in Santa Cruz County, has provided bilingual dental services for more than 5,000 low-income children this year. In 2015, students in 15 county schools received free dental care. Dientes visited each school twice this year, giving free screenings and cleanings of which the children might otherwise not have been able to afford. Dientes also gave parents dental report cards along with dental care and nutrition advice. Dientes also serves low-income seniors and runs a homeless outreach program. Thanks to Dientes, there are thousands of happier and healthier smiles in Santa Cruz County this holiday season. On Saturday, December 5th, Santa Cruz residents enjoyed the annual holiday parade on Pacific Avenue. Young and old, political and non-political, walking, dancing, prancing, and driving participants were applauded by hundreds of onlookers, and of course, there was music. Let's take a look at the Mission Hill Junior High Marching Band leading off the parade. It's hackathon season. During a hackathon, computer programmers and others collaborate on software projects, usually over a weekend at a local university. In November, CSUMB held its startup hackathon Monterey Bay, where Bay Area students built Android apps to solve real world problems. The organizers solicited mobile app ideas from local nonprofits and small businesses. Speakers pitched ideas to student developers. Participants voted to select the top app ideas and the teams. Fueled with pizza Friday night, along with snacks, soda, and meals throughout the 40-hour sprint, nine teams tackled projects as diverse as database development to a brainwave music finder. Eric Tao, CSUMB professor of computing and design, said, this type of event gives students a chance to work on real world problems, engage with the community, and have a real impact on society. According to Tao, in three days, students learn that they can build something. It might not be 100%, but they demonstrated that they can make this work. In the end, if they participated, they have won. Four judges invested time with each team, watching as they demonstrated their prototypes. In the end, the judges had trouble picking just one winner and awarded first place to two teams. This January 29th through the 31st, there are two events in our area. The annual UCSC Hackathon on the UCSC campus offers $80,000 in prizes. At the same time, CSUMB will hold Startup Weekend Monterey Bay. For more information, go to csumb.startupweekend.org or hackucsc.com. Thanks to the Santa Cruz Tech Beat for contributing to this item. On Sunday, November 22nd, the Climate Changes Everything rally marched through downtown Santa Cruz from the Episcopal Church to San Lorenzo Park. Now we have a clip of that march and rally.
Watch your car, get a bike, or use your feet to take a hike. significant climate change through the burning of fossil fuels and the clearing of forests. It's the most and important thing you will do for the rest of your life. thank Scott Smith for documenting both the rally and the march. Today I'm going to be talking with Michael Gasser. He is a environmental justice activist here in Santa Cruz. He is one of the people that organized the rally and is also one of the founders of the new Santa Cruz Climate Action Network here in Santa Cruz. Michael, just recently, uh, the thing in the news was the Paris talks, the treaty, not treaty, but the agreement that they came to. Uh, if you could give us your viewpoint about that agreement and what you thought were the good and the bad things for it. Sure. Um, first, a little background. This is the culmination of a process that started in 1992 uh, with the agreement among basically eventually all the countries of the world, all 196 countries of the world, called the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Basically, the United Nations accepted the fact that climate change was happening and at an international level, something needed to be done about it. And starting in uh, 1995, they began having annual meetings, um, This, uh, all the signatories to the, to the treaty. Uh, and the culmination of this process was the 21st meeting that just happened in Paris ending last uh, Saturday and the agreement that came out of that, the Paris Agreement, it will be called. There's even now, I noticed, a website called parisagreement.org where you can find out everything you want about this treaty. It's not a treaty, again. <laughs> It, it, if it were more binding, it would be a treaty. It was agreed to through consensus by every single country in the world, which is quite an achievement uh, for every single country in the world to agree to anything. They haven't signed it yet. That will happen next year uh, at some point, uh, at which point it'll go into effect. So the fact that this could happen at all is an important achievement in a mm -hmm. sense. I, I'd like to quote what George Monbiot said. He's a commentator from The Guardian, and he said, by comparison to what it could have been, it's a miracle. And so th there is something miraculous about this. But then he says, by comparison to what it should have been, it's a disaster. The talks in Paris are the best there have ever been, and that is a terrible indictment. So basically, there's a lot of very nice language in the agreement, in the 30-something pages of mm -hmm. the agreement, language that makes people feel very good and feel that the world cares about this problem and is going to do something about it. But there are serious gaps between the language and what can actually be expected to happen. And those are the kinds of things that I'd like to focus on in what, what basically is a critique of the agreement. So it doesn't sound like, you know, those, those are not very positive words in a certain sense. Uh, can you get into some of the details about what you're, what you're talking about at this point? Right. Well, there are two kinds of gaps. And um, the agreement 
the purpose of the agreement is to cut greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. It's mainly greenhouse gas emissions, though not only greenhouse gas emissions, that are responsible for climate change. And almost everyone that's taken seriously now believes that mm -hmm. in the world, including all of these countries that participated in this process. So the first goal, the main goal of this whole process, starting back in the 90s, was to cut greenhouse gas emissions. The problem is the gap between what the agreement says the nations of the world would like to achieve and what can be achieved under, under, the, under the agreement, under the terms of the agreement. The problem is the following, that uh, the individual countries were expected to submit to the United Nations what, what were called INDCs, Intended Nationally Determined Contributions. Each country, and there were up to 180 of them did as of last week, submitted its proposal for what it would attempt to do in cutting its own greenhouse gas emissions. It was entirely up to individual governments to do this. And they range all across the board. An independent uh, organization evaluated these and found of all those 180, only two countries actually submitted uh, reports, uh, intended contributions, mm -hmm. that were in keeping with what the United Nations would like to see happen. Those two countries, unfortunately, are two of the smallest countries in the world and two of the poorest countries okay. in the world. Let me see if I understand <laughs> what you're saying here. You're saying that all the countries, only two countries, very small portion of what is actually needed to reduce greenhouse. And this is only an intention, not an actual agreement to do so. And the other 180 com countries haven't submitted anything. Uh, so we have no idea whether they are, what their intent is at this point. No, that's not the case. We have 180 intentions. Uh, okay. And those intentions next year will become, the, the I will go away, and those will be nationally determined contributions. Those are pledges uh -huh. that, that each of these 180 countries is making for what they intend to do beginning in 2020. The Paris Agreement takes effect in 2020, really. And so none of these intended contributions, none of these uh, national contributions will, will take effect until then. The problem is, first, that they're not strong enough. That if all of the countries did what they said they would do, that global temperatures will rise eventually to three degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels, okay. far higher than the United Nations in this agreement says is acceptable. Two okay. degrees and, and if possible 1.5 is what they're saying. Okay. So if each country holds to what it says, then, then this agreement will fail. The problem is that each country may not hold to what it says because there's no agreed on mechanism for, for assessing the extent to which they have. Now they're required to report back beginning in 2023 and then every five years each country is expected to report back on its progress at making its goals and, and, and expected to make new goals. But no one really knows to what extent any of this will actually work. What is the current prediction for the rise to three, three degrees? Uh, when do they expect that to occur uh, with the way things are going right now? I think we're talking about 2050. I, I'm not sure about that. I think okay. we're talking about 2050. People are not so worried about the time when that happens. Uh -huh. They're worried about the consequence of that happening at all, mm -hmm. whenever it happens. If it happens, disastrous consequences are expected. We're already seeing with one degree. We're very close now to one degree above pre-industrial levels, and we're already seeing the effects of climate change happening all over the world, in particular in, in certain parts of the world. Right. So what will happen with three degrees, it's hard to say. There are all kinds of predictions that, that people are making. No one wants that. Uh, okay. Two degrees, uh, no one really wants either. Yeah. But what, three, certainly not. Certainly not. So right now, the first part of it is that we have intentions, intentions which don't meet uh, success at this point, assuming right. that they were actually done. Right. What's the other part of the agreement? Well, let me say one more thing about, okay. the, about the emissions part. The, the, the question is, how do you actually achieve this? How do, how do nations achieve this? It's, it's accepted by climate scientists that in order for this to happen, 80% of the reserves of fossil fuels need to stay in the ground, need to, and not to come out and, and be burnt. Uh, unfortunately, the Paris Agreement never mentions fossil fuels. Nowhere in the Paris Agreement do the words appear 
do we hear about coal? Do we hear about petroleum and do we hear about natural gas? Instead, the Paris Agreement talks about climate neutrality. They talk about a balance between anthropogenic emissions by sources and removals by sinks of greenhouse gases. So they're really counting on some kind of bioengineering, some kind of geoengineering, mm -hmm. sorry, some kind of technique to sequester the carbon that's, that's getting out. Uh, untested techniques. Does it mention alternative energies at all? They mention them in a few places, but very, there's very little mention of them. The word energy actually only appears three times in the ah. entire document. So. Okay, well. So the second gap is the gap uh, between the developed countries and the developing countries. This has been a bone of contention throughout the UN process from the very, very beginning. It's been recognized from the beginning that the, the, the countries, the part of the world that's really responsible for this problem is the developed world. Those are the countries that are spewing these, these uh, greenhouse gases in, into the atmosphere and causing the problem. The poor countries are not causing it. Mm -hmm. The problem, of course, is that the poor countries are suffering more than the rich countries from the consequences and will suffer even more in the future. So, so this is the United States, Europe, Russia, uh, China, and India? Canada, Australia, countries like this, um, other countries that are pretty high on the list are, of course, uh, the EU and uh, Saudi Arabia, um, more and more China. China is now the leader in greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, China is the leader in population, but it passed the U.S. in its greenhouse gas emissions. So China is growing very fast. Well, you know, it's regard. been in, in the news, the Beijing smog problem has been, right. has been uh, quite quite right. uh, uh, well, significant. Smog is, is a somewhat different problem, but the interesting thing about the smog is it's convincing people in China that, that things need to be done about this. China is actually looking like it's more proactive than the United States at this point when it comes to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Have the developing countries done anything to help, uh, offered anything to the what? developing companies, offered right. anything to the developing countries to that's help been, them mitigate it? That's been part of these agreements through, through history. And what we have from, from the Copenhagen Agreement made uh, in 2009 is a pledge that by 2020, $100 billion a year will, will, be, will be given basically by the, by the North to the South to help mm -hmm. with this. No one at this point believes that that's going to happen or knows where it's going to come from. Uh, and so uh, it look, right. uh, uh, estimates have been made that $600 billion w might do the job. $100 billion has been pledged. But well, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop there. Our time is up. This is a huge topic. I want to thank you for being with us and thank you with being on Santa Cruz Currents. Thanks for having me. Technology is ever present in our society. Here is Sarah Eisenberg with the latest on the growing technology scene in Santa Cruz. I'm Sarah Eisenberg, founder and publisher of Santa Cruz Tech Beat. Santa Cruz TechBeat is the go-to source for all things tech in our region, from comprehensive news about local tech business developments and startups, to thought leadership from our local tech ecosystem. Plus, Santa Cruz TechBeat has job and event listings, resources, and more. I'm here to tell you about some current developments in the local tech scene that you need to know. It was a fiber love fest. On December 8th, the Santa Cruz City Council unanimously approved moving forward with a fiber to the home gigabit network. The project will provide internet service for residents and businesses at speeds that are 10 to 100 times faster than current connections. The city, in partnership with local internet service provider Cruzio and the nonprofit Development Council, will pursue lease revenue bonds to pay for the lion's share of the tab. The next step is for the city and Cruzio to agree on detailed terms for the deal and to then arrange the bond financing. This project, expected to take three years to roll out, will be the first fiber to the home gigabit in Silicon Valley. That is, if you define Santa Cruz as being part of Silicon Valley. Earlier this month, Linda Weinman and Bruce Heaven, founders of the online learning company Lynda.com, shared their passion, startup challenges, and success stories during a lively talk at the brand new Colligan Theater in Santa Cruz. The event was part of CSUMB's President Speaker Series. The founders traced the evolution of Lynda.com 
from humble self-funded beginnings in 1995 to their $1.5 billion acquisition by LinkedIn earlier this year. Weinman and Heaven said the call from LinkedIn was totally unexpected, but ultimately they decided the timing was right. LinkedIn has the largest database of job seekers in the world. IDE Corporation, an industrial, mechanical, and electronics design and development company located in Scotts Valley, will celebrate their 30th anniversary early next year. IDE takes product ideas from concept through all the development stages so that the product is ready for mass manufacturing. Products include, for example, medical devices, carbon fiber bicycles, consumer electronics, wearables, and more. IDE works with all size companies, from small startups to Silicon Valley giants. I call IDE the 30-year-old company you've never heard of because typically they stay behind the scenes once the product is released. Local company Full Power, a technology leader for wearables, wearable and sensor-based devices, has been awarded a new patent covering a sleep monitoring system, including monitoring a user's movement to determine when the user is falling asleep. It can also distinguish between power naps and longer sleep. Sounds good. The technology enables users to optimize their sleep patterns so that they feel more refreshed. Full Power has a variety of other patents for technologies used in activity trackers, smart watches, and smart beds. That right, that's right, smart beds. Thanks for watching. Tune in next time for more news and developments from the Santa Cruz tech scene. And of course, for the latest news, jobs, and events anytime, go to santacruztechbeat.com. Thank you, Sarah, for that update on the tech scene here in Santa Cruz. YouTube is a great way to share your world with others. Let us now share the world of Santa Cruz with you. This is the Santa Cruz Currents YouTube Roundup, where we highlight YouTube uploads from the Santa Cruz area. Let's start off with a little ukulele music. Oh, that hurt. Get a little under the Monterey Bay action here. A little bit about how technology can help the planet. And then, of course, typical YouTube cat pictures. And a little video about cat behavior. That's this week's YouTube Roundup. Hope you enjoy. Those ukuleles sure are strumming along. And strumming right along, here is our community calendar with things that are going on in our community.
are wrapping up our final episode of Santa Cruz Currents for the year. We thank you for watching and we hope that you will join us in the new year as we continue to cover what's current in Santa Cruz. Happy holidays from your friends from Santa Cruz Currents.